Hey there, everybody, and welcome to the Raw Review here on Wrestling With Regret. My apologies, this video is not coming out as early on Tuesday as it normally does. When I came back home from Ring of Honor weekend, I had just enough energy after all the traveling I've been doing to watch Raw last night, but not enough energy to watch Raw and then produce a review about it afterward, immediately following. So it's Tuesday morning now, and I'm here to give you this video, so here we go. Raw begins with Randy Orton cutting a promo on AJ Styles, who then comes out to, to counterpoint him. We're supposed to get Orton versus Styles in one-on-one -on -one action here in this show, but we don't get that exactly. More on that later, though. AJ on the mic says many people are saying that his RKO from last week was actually better than Randy's. Then Drew McIntyre comes out and says, you know, you guys are having this RKO measuring contest. My Claymore is bigger. He gets a great reaction out of Randy where he's kind of like shrug your shoulders and like throws the microphone in the air because of the absurdity of that comment. Then we uh, one thing leads to another and we get a triple threat match. Now, Drew is added to the mix here. AJ and Orton take Drew out for a while after the commercial break, so it's mostly AJ and Randy stuff here. AJ tries to hit the RKO on two occasions on Randy, but he gets blocked. Orton does hit the Styles Clash on AJ, though, and to top that off, then a couple minutes later, Orton does hit AJ with the RKO. So AJ is not able to get any of his finishers off. Orton hits two different finishers, one of which is his rivals. So anyway, after, AJ, after Orton hits the RKO, uh, Drew Claymore's Orton out of the ring, and then Drew covers AJ to win the match. So yes, the RKO, still the most protected finisher in the biz, and Drew actually wins this one, so it's nice to see. And so, yeah, we'll see how it goes, because these three guys are all in the Rumble match, so we'll see where that goes. But I thought it was very interesting. AJ tries to hit the RKO and can't. Oh, but Orton gets hit the Styles Clash, though. We get a recap of what happened last week when the Big Show helped out Kevin Owens and Samoa Joe against Seth and Friends, and they hype up the fist fight for later in the night. Then we go to a backstage promo by Seth and the AOP talking about the fist fight and everything. The way he talks about, tonight! We will impose our will. Tonight, everyone will embrace the vision of the Monday Night Messiah. His emphasis on tonight, I thought was very interesting. You know, it was a very dramatic monologue, but Seth is definitely owning it here. Go to our next match, Ricochet versus Mojo Rawley, and so many questions about Mojo Rawley. First off, what is his outfit? What is going on with anything going on with that look of his? What happened to the fractured thing he had where it's like the, the blue lines in his face yelling at himself in a mirror? What happened to that whole thing? Why is there no follow-up to the fact that he was with the first person to see what's in Rowan's cage? Got none of that. Anyway, this match was a nice little match here. Ricochet wins at the 630. Da, da, da. And then we go to backstage with the Street Profits with more exposition. Ford doing a great job here. You know, I think the, the one thing that kind of took me out of it here was they made they shoehorn an Oscars reference, an Oscars ballot reference, into the promo. Then they reference the fact they made a reference, and then make a face into the camera. Yes, guys, we know what you're doing. Despite that, though, Ford is just great in this role. Like his his his, his exposition skills, his oratory skills are just top notch stuff. He is such a great talker. And then at the end, uh, Dawkins goes, "Hey, Kerwin, selfies. Play the music to the next match." And we go to that match now as Charlotte takes on Sarah Logan in a proper match. Last week never really got started. They were fighting over Charlotte's robe. And this is also a relatively short match. They spend a lot of time on the outside. We almost get this like this very close call to a double count out, but we don't get that though. Right back in the ring though, Charlotte makes Sarah tap out with the figure eight. Then afterward, I guess Charlotte's new gimmick is after the match, the referee puts her robe back on. That's two weeks in a row of that. And then she beats down Sarah some more. That was necessary. My thing after seeing this match is they're talking about how Charlotte's going to be in the women's Rumble match. I'm worried about how that match is going to go. Like I've got a good idea of like who might be winning the Rumble match, but I feel it's going to be kind of lacking and uneven in terms of star power. Because who are they promoting on TV right now? On Raw and SmackDown, you have the four horsewomen. At least one of them are not going to be in the Rumble match. You've got the Kabuki Warriors. Again, half of that team not in the Rumble match. You've got like Dana Brooke, Lacey Evans, Carmella... Natalia, I might be forgetting a couple people, but I mean, like, as far as women who are being actually given any kind of special good, good treatment, oh, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, I guess. And then there's the NXT women, and we'll see how many of them get involved as well. But yeah, this one I'm not feeling so good about in terms of like, how the quality of that match is going to go. I could be wrong, though. It's Brocky Brock time. Paul Heyman having some fun with the local people of Kentucky, making fun of them. And then by the time he's getting into his opening shtick, the fans are just like raining booze down on him. They are eating out of the palm of his 
hand. Like, they, he leaves the ring for a minute, comes back in there, and this whole thing, he hasn't even gotten to the point of what he's saying in this promo, and they're already just, like, rabid with him. So that that is just, I mean, it's easy to say Paul Heyman's a great promo, but the fact he's able to also control them and just get them so whipped up, that is just, that's expert heat right there. He barely had to do anything uh, with that. Anyway, he's basically reiterating that Brock's going to dominate the Rumble match. I don't really say anything new about that, but as he's talking, he goes, oh, you know, my spoilers are awesome. They're always right. The truth will set you free. Oh, does someone say truth? Here comes a 24-7 champion, R-Truth, who says he is declaring the Royal Rumble. Those are his words. And then he says, you know, he's going to throw Paul Heyman over the top rope and this great shot where we do a, a zoom into Paul Heyman, who's like, what? And Lesnar's laughing. It was a great reaction. And, and, and Truth is totally deadpan about this, too. He's very serious. And then Heyman, I think, calls him Bong Hit. Did I hear that correctly? He called R-Truth Bong Hit. He says he's not in the Rumble match. Then Truth the undeclares for the Rumble match. He tells Heyman that he talks too much. Then he tells Lesnar, what's up? Starts dancing. His music plays. Brock just decks him. Hits him with the F5. And then grabs the mic. That's what's up. Which is great. The one thing that would have made it better, though, is if he pinned R-Truth with 24-7 Championship and consolidated them. That would have been awesome. But more of the title later. But, you know, this was just such an entertaining segment. It felt like it was a house show segment to me. Just the way that, like, again, the way that Heyman kind of played with the audience, going out of the ring, coming back in, was really milking the crowd there. I thought that was very cool to see him do. R-Truth, like, just how often are you going to see R-Truth and Lesnar interacting in the ring together like that? That was really cool. And Truth is just... Truth is a treasure. Then after the match, after the match, the whole segment there, after he's being helped to the back by the referees, Mojo Roy comes back and jumps uh, Truth, pins him to become the new 24-7 champion. Then we get an awful long time where he's like standing there like celebrating. He's like, they, they don't play his music. And so he's just like having this very drawn out celebration on the ramp. You think someone else is going to come out, but he does. no one else shows up. It's just Mojo is the champion. So there we go. We will see where the 24-7, where, where the Mojo Rawley era, how that's going to go for the 24 7 title. Lana and Lashley cut in a promo. They're recapping everything that happened in the wedding. Again, why at this point, why do you need to keep bringing that up? She does mention that Liv Morgan interrupted, but makes no mention of the whole bombshell that she dropped, saying that they were apparently were in love at one point. But she carries on says, we're going to make some New Year's resolutions. One, everyone's jealous of us. And two, you know, we're going to crush Rusev. Not sure if one of those is a resolution, but go off. And we go to that match now as Bobby Lashley takes on Rusev. And where's Liv Morgan? Because she was supposed to be in Rusev's corner. She made that very clear last week on Raw, but she's not there. Announcers make zero mention of her. So moving on, though, it's crazy that for the first time in this entire God for Second storyline, we actually get a good match out of it. Because Rusev and Lashley, I think they've only wrestled maybe twice on television slash network before this matchup here. Like from September to now, the fact they've only had three matches, that is amazing amazing restraint. When you see other rivalries and stuff and other main uh, main like main event storylines and how often they fight on a weekly basis in singles and tags and triple threats and stuff. Amazing restraint. This has been mostly a story-based storyline. For all, you know, for all the negativity that it gets and rightfully so, like it's cool they've been able to kind of like space out the number of actual matches these two have been having. And it's a good match as well. I think that the order in which they've been doing it's kind of weird because I felt like their match at their match at Starcade and then the uh, the tables match at TLC like those were way more high impact and like high intensity and personal than this straight up wrestling match was actually done really well but again the order of which they have these matches and the styles and the stories they're trying to tell that to me is a bit wonky anyway Liv Morgan appears finally and she confronts Lana and again like there's no mention of Liv, you know no one says on commentary what was the deal with when Liv said she was in love with Lana no mention of that and I'll get to my main point with that in a little bit but anyway Lana throws a drink in Liv's face and checks her into the wall and screams never again. In the distraction, Lashley hits Rusev with a spear and wins the match. So again, he's like, he just keeps beating Rusev over and over again, which is also kind of frustrating. Then after the match backstage, we see Lashley and Lana again, and Lana referring to Liv as a troll and a stalker, but again, making no real mention or explanation as to what, what Liv meant when she said what she said at the wedding. She makes a challenge for a mixed challenge, herself and Lashley versus uh, Rusev and Liv Morgan. Lashley is very upset by this. He says, I just wrestled Rusev and now you want me to wrestle him again and I have to, I have to protect you? So he's very pissed and he storms off and everything. It's the most real emotion I've seen from Lashley, I think in his entire, since his return to the company.
opening. The Viking Raiders make another opening challenge, and this time the Singh brothers answer the challenge here, but they take too much time with their entrance, the Vikings have had enough, and it's a big squash match, pretty short. And then we go right backstage again to see Rusev and Liv recovering after the match. Rusev has some fighting words for Lashley, and then Liv says that she is the personification of Lana's karma, and that karma is not only a goddess, but also it's a bitch. It's a lover, it's a child, it's a mother. But here's my thing with this whole, we have three segments of Lana and Lashley and Rusev and Liv. What is Liv Morgan's role in this storyline now? Because they had three segments to talk about it and what Liv said in the in the wedding thing. You know, she's loved my life, da da da. They make no mention of that. Not on commentary, not on promos. They're either really stretching this thing out or I think a more plausible theory to me is they are ignoring it and they're trying to tuck that whole lesbian angle away and pretend it never happened. Because we got a little bit of a mention, oh, like, I'm her karma, oh, she's a stalker and a troll. But what does that mean at this point? Because, again, you know, here's the thing. When WWE wants to let you know about a wrinkle in the storyline or tell you about some kind of angle, they will make it very obvious, either in promos or they'll say it on commentary to help drive the story along. But we got none of that. And that, to me, was a big red flag. Like, are they really going to backpedal on this Liv Morgan thing? Like, they just did it for shock value. Oh, she was my lover. I mean, okay, it's again, it's either that is the explanation that they're just going to try and forget and hope we forget, or they're just doing a really, really very elaborate, stretched out job. Maybe next week we'll finally hear what the story is. Maybe we probably won't. That's my thing. Is like, at this point, the fact they haven't mentioned it at all, to me, says they're forgetting about it. Contract signing time up next as Asuka and Becky Lynch get ready for their title match at the Rumble pay-per-view. Jerry Lawler's presiding over the ordeal, and by the way, Kyrie Sane, nice to see her back on TV. She's accompanying Asuka to the ring for this segment. Becky is unusually quiet for this bit here, and she thinks long and hard before signing the contract, and when she does, and when, the, when both parties have signed, Asuka sprays Becky in the face with the green mist, and Becky is selling like death, like she's like in pain. The EMTs have to come in and walk wash it out of her mouth, uh, her mouth, her eyes, probably out of her mouth too, but out of her eyes with water and everything, and the, she's just like in so much pain. They're really selling this as more intense than ever before with the mist, I think. And then Becky goes into a surprisingly like articulate and drawn out promo uh, saying, you know, I've been happy and content and Asuka's been angry and hungry, and so basically if she goes down at the Rumble, she's taking Asuka with her. You know, on the one hand, like, yeah, it's kind of cool that like, it's kind of badass that she was composed enough to like really articulate her feelings and say all that but at the same time like you just got sprayed in the face of this poisonous mist and your eyes are burning and you have like this this really good speech in your back pocket ready to bust out wouldn't it have been more impactful if she said fewer words but there were just you know more powerful words like the last half of what she said you know if i you know if i if i go down i'm going down swinging da, da, da. that part i think was good if we just had a cut there but then she has this whole monologue as she's also kind of like semi-blinded like that almost took me out of it but I think it was overall a very strong segment and Becky and Asuka in their own ways both look like stars here we find out next week Rey Mysterio is going to challenge Andrade for the US title in a ladder match which concerns me deeply after having seen the Rey Mysterio uh, Eddie Guerrero ladder match at SummerSlam 05 I certainly hope they can keep themselves safer this time around but anyway we get some kind of dueling promos between the two sides we get Zelina and Andrade and Zelina says that Rey is a criminal and a disgraced Latinos every Everywhere, including his son Dominic and the rest of his children. Then we get Ray's counterattack, and he's very passionate here, cutting a promo both in Spanish and in English. I think it's very interesting they're bringing cultural representation into this feud now. Like we've seen, you know, the, the battle of who's the next big Latino superstar, who's gonna rep who's gonna be like the big draw for Latino viewers. We've been seeing that for decades at this point. So it's interesting they're actually making it kind of like very uh, uh, bare and bare out to the world now. This is for the future of who will be the champion of the Latino people. Uh, we'll see how that plays out, but it's very interesting they're actually making that so out in the open. And of course, because we just saw Zelina Vega, that means the next thing we see is Aleister Black as he gets ready to take on Bud Murph in their latest encounter. They've done a really good job all night building up this matchup and how good these guys are. So great job by the commentary team and the video production staff to really build up how good of a feud this has been. And also a really good bit of commentary by Lawler during this matchup when he talks about his experience with wrestlers he was never able to beat. 
guys like Nick Bockwinkel, Randy Savage, Bret Hart. Really cool to get that kind of you know that kind of line from Lawler. I mean, bring in his experience as a wrestler. I think it's always nice to hear that from the legends doing commentary and stuff. And this match is as good as advertised. More of the same great action you've seen from these guys in their previous encounters. But the finish is kind of weird because you know, Black hits the Black Mass on Buddy. Pinfall. One, two. Oh, Buddy seemed to get his shoulder up, but he didn't. It looked really weird from, uh, from both angles I saw. Like, he got a leg up, but from what I could tell, he didn't really get a, a shoulder up unless it was, like, paper-thin space between, like, his shoulder and the mat, enough for the referee to make that call to stop the count. So then they just kind of call it audible. Black hits another one, and so then Black wins, and that's how it goes. So the finish was odd, but everything before that, I think, was great. And so then, after the match, we get this kind of moment where Buddy is slumped up against the barricade on the floor, and he's just shaking his head in disbelief. Like, I think the, this actually finally broke him. In fact, Murphy is so affected by that loss, he's still sitting at ringside as we go to our next matchup of Eric Rowan versus the local talent. Rowan wants to pull the critter out of the cage and show it to everyone, but it, it bites him in the hand and it draws blood. And now Rowan's very upset. He beats up the jobber some more. Cool, like, blood-soaked iron claw to end the matchup there. Curious and curiouser. Main event time. It's being built as a fist fight as Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe, and The Big Show take on Seth Rollins and AOP. What is a fist fight? It's basically a street fight or a no-holds-barred match, but the only way to win is by referee stoppage when all three members of one team are down. It's very interesting they would debut this concept in a multi-man match and not something like more like one-on-one -on -one or maybe even two-on-two, -two, but we'll see how it plays out. It's a big old brawl from the get-go, and we kind of separate after a while where Seth and Big Show are fighting, and then AOP's taking on Samoa Joe and Kevin. At one point, Owens runs up the quarter pipe on the set and does a dive onto the rest of them, which is so cool to watch. And so then they're down for a while, down to Seth and Big Show. Uh, Rollins is powered on the outside, but he's still there. <laughs> Again, slumped against the barricade at ringside. He's like, help us, help us, which is pretty funny as he's like this impassioned plea to a catatonic Buddy Murphy and everything. Show hits a choke slam on Seth and gets ready for the knockout punch, but then Buddy Murphy hits him with a low blow from out of nowhere. And then he and Seth drive Show through the table that was set up earlier in the match. AOP take out Samoa and Joe and Kevin Owens to the slam for the announce table. Then they double powerbomb the Big Show, which is both impressive and scary as hell, because I can't imagine Big Show is going to take a whole lot of bumps like that this year. That was his one big bump of the year, and that was it. Stomped by Seth. The Messiah Maniacs win, and they seemingly add a new member in Buddy Murphy because he and Seth hug it out at the end. I loved this closing segment. Despite how hokey the whole like fist fight thing was, the whole setup for that, it was still like a really fun brawl that we saw with all these guys. The whole setup of Buddy getting beat by Aleister Black like a half hour before, and then just sitting at rings the whole time and waiting to pick his spot at the end was a really nice touch. Like he saw like with Seth like pleading to him like he was finally convinced. He realized what his purpose was. It was to help the Messiah of Monday Night Raw. And uh, ending the way it was, I mean, again, like I said last week with the Aleister Black Buddy Murphy stuff, wouldn't this be far more compelling if Seth were champion right now still and like that was what this was all for, like control of Raw as champion and as the Monday Night Messiah. That's a bit of a nitpick, but the storyline itself and like what they saw in this segment I thought was great. My final grade for this week's Raw is an A-. I really enjoyed this week's Raw. I think, you know, except for a couple of matches that didn't really do anything for me, like Charlotte and Sarah Logan and Ricochet and Mojo Raleigh, the rest of the stuff that we saw on this show I think was really great. I think that the action was mostly good, really solid promo work by everyone involved, got a nice bit of levity with Lesnar and Truth and Heyman. The main event segment I think was really well done, especially the uh, interweaving of Buddy Murphy into the angle now. Again, my biggest issue with this episode was how they treated Liv Morgan in the build for all everything else going on with Rusev and Lashley and Lana. They had two interviews and a match to do something to build that up, and we got they, they totally whiffed it. So again, they're either really deliberately stretching this thing out and going to wait until the time is right to expose what's going on, or they're backpedaling on the lesbian thing, which if they do that completely cheapens this already cheap moment of Liv uh, interrupting the wedding to begin with, and it just makes you wonder why was she there at all, and why is she here involved in this matchup, and why do we care about Liv Morgan now? It's just it's a really weird departure from what she used to be before she was taken off TV. We still don't really have an explanation as to why she cut off the wedding other than what she said, which has never been followed up since then. So again, that's that really sticks to my craw, but everything else about this episode, I really enjoyed. But let me know what you thought about Raw this week in the comments section below, and be sure to give it a letter grade by going to the iCard in the corner of your screen. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.